Professor Clements with you as we talk about telescopes. So, astronomers would like to learn about the stars and planets, and uh, they're pretty dim. I know that you'd have trouble going out and reading a book at night, uh, far from any city lights. So, what role does the telescope play in that? And also, how do we see details on the surface of the moon, surface of planets, details on how uh, stars and dust clouds are arranged in galaxies, clusters of galaxies? How's that all work from a location observing site on the surface of the Earth or a telescope in orbit around the Earth? Uh, so there's going to be more in this uh, video than is in the book. Uh, tying in with my interest in telescopes. Uh, let's see what we can discover. So we have two types of telescopes. We can have refractor telescopes that use lens, a lens to gather the light from the object, or we can have reflector telescopes that use a mirror to gather light from the object. The uh, uh, mirror here, concave showing, um, for professional telescopes this will be a parabola. Um, we won't get into that detail. For a refractor telescope, we have a lens gathering the light. The lens here, this convex lens and this concave mirror, would both be called the objective, where the uh, light is first gathered from the object. That's the objective. And then there'll be an eyepiece for both of these arrangements. We'll see that later. So here's a couple of designs of telescopes. We have a distant object, a tree. It's uh, much further away in practice than shown in this drawing. But uh, a Galilean telescope would be a telescope that uses a converging lens for the objective and a diverging lens for the eyepiece. In this situation, the image is upright, same orientation as the object. A more common astronomical telescope uses two converging lenses to, uh, to form the image. And in this situation, the image will be inverted. Uh, Galileo did not invent the telescope. Hans Lippershey invented the telescope uh, shortly before Galileo used the telescope. Galileo did build his own telescopes and was the first to record um, astronomical observations of any uh, uh, great extent, although it might have been used in, in England, a telescope uh, before Galileo. But Galileo really is the big start for using telescopes in astronomy. It is uh, worth noting here on this objective, it's going to have a long focal length. This is a contrast to the microscope. The objective of the telescope has long focal length, and it produces an image, and is the same as the microscope. The eyepiece is used as a simple magnifier to uh, enlarge the uh, first image formed by the objective. So. Let's go a little further here. Another view of a refracting telescope uh, in just the basics of uh, converging lens as the objective gathers light. We have a focus here. And really, this should be further back towards the eyepiece. Uh, the eyepiece then forms the uh, image that is viewed by the eye. Galileo's telescope, uh, this is uh, the original, um, has uh, survived through the years, about three feet long. And again, converging lens at one end, diverging lens at the other end. Uh, a little more detail on Galileo's telescope, how the uh, light is converged from the converging lens and then comes out more or less parallel to the eye out of the eyepiece. Um, would be a Galilean telescope or opera glass would be the same optical design. Uh, Galileo's telescopes are mounted in the Science Museum in Florence. Uh, it's a nice trip. A lot of many other uh, scientific instruments displayed in the Science Museum. Very well worth the time to, uh, to go through it. Um, as uh, telescopes developed over the years, they, uh, some historical things here. Uh, late 1600s, this telescope was 150 feet long, very unwieldy to point at the desired object, but uh, had a uh, an advantage of this length of combating chromatic aberration. We'll talk about that later. Uh, the largest uh, refracting telescope, 40 inches in diameter, uh, the Yerkes Observatory north of Chicago. 
but uh, 1895 and constructed a very large lens, 40 inches in diameter. Again, gathering the light, bringing it down to an eyepiece. Um, largest refracting telescope, 1895. Uh, what's holding back the progress? Why is uh, 40 inches the largest refracting telescope? Well, refracting telescopes have two problems. One is glass is not perfectly solid. It flexes. And when we get larger than 40 inches, the weight of the lens uh, causes the lens to flex as the telescope is directed to different parts of the sky. Well, if this uh, curved surface is flexing, that's going to lead to out-of-focus images. Um, well, if the lens is flexing, let's uh, correct that. Let's put some iron straps on the back of the lens to make it more rigid. Uh, what's wrong with that solution? And you should realize that those, those uh, iron straps are going to block the light and defeat the purpose of having a large lens. A second problem for refracting telescopes is this subjective has chromatic aberration. Uh, glass refracts uh, different colors of light in different angles. We've already studied that. Dispersion and uh, this causes the blue light to be at a different focus than the red light um, giving, giving us a poorer image. So the solution is to make a reflecting telescope. In a reflecting telescope the back of the glass mirror can be braced, can be supported so that the uh, mirror does not change shape as the telescope points to different directions in the sky. All the light bounces off the front of the mirror. The light is not going through the mirror. So we can put uh, as much bracing as we want, almost, on the back of the mirror. Um, and the defeat of chromatic aberration is that light from a mirror, uh, theta in equals theta out, regardless of the wavelength. So all colors reflect at the same angle. There's no chromatic aberration for the objective in a uh, reflecting telescope. Uh, again, reminder on the chromatic aberration. Index refraction is larger for purple than for red. So we get a different uh, focal point. This can be corrected with an acromat lens. And in a camera, this is not uncommon to have a corrective uh, lens system so all the colors focus at the same place. Um, we're not going to study the details of that. So one design of a reflecting telescope due to Newton. Uh, light comes into the objective mirror, reflects to a flat mirror, and off the side of the telescope then is the eyepiece. Uh, so open tube here, the mirror is down at this end, flat mirror up here, eyepiece for viewing here, and this would be a guide uh, finder telescope. Another view of this, we've got our objective mirror, converging light, strikes this parallel mirror, comes to a focus, and then the eyepiece again views this as a, uh, um, as a simple magnifier. So Newton had this design of a uh, reflecting telescope, flat mirror here, an eyepiece up here, and this is called a Newtonian type of telescope. Um, again, open up here, light comes in, the objective mirror down here, Newton made a mirror and uh, brought to light to a focus uh, just short of the eyepiece, and we view it. Um, around 1900, astronomers learned how to coat glass with uh, silver and uh, uh, could now build very large, high-quality telescopes that gave good images. So 100 inches in diameter, 1917. Uh, 1999, 315-inch diameter mirror polished to a very high accuracy into the shape of a parabola, um, one of the Gemini telescope mirrors. Large telescopes today on the Earth are made with multiple mirrors that are uh, set side by side. It's easier to make a small mirror and then put them side by side with computers controlling the tilt of these uh, sections of parabola. Uh, to form a very large mirror, 36 of these uh, uh, mirror blanks here. And this is on a, a, a dormant volcano in Hawaii, the Keck telescope. Uh, the two telescopes can be uh, operated uh, somewhat together. 
multiple mirror telescope in Arizona. Again, a set of smaller mirrors where the light is brought to a common focus to uh, gain light collecting power and not face the problem of a huge mirror. It's very difficult to make these large mirrors, 300 inches in diameter. So smaller mirrors are put together and we still obtain uh, comparable diameter, 300 inches across or more. Hubble telescope in 1990 put into orbit, a 94 inch mirror is its diameter. Um, has the advantage of being outside of our atmosphere, so no clouds, uh, it's 24 hours of darkness, point the telescope away from the sun, and uh, you know, no twinkling sky effects, you can see all the wavelengths of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. However, if your calibrating instruments when you polish the mirror are incorrect, you end up with the result for the Hubble telescope as shown here. This was the initial uh, image, uh, very much poorer quality than what was expected. The Hubble telescope is in an orbit that is accessible for manned spaceflight. And by 1993, there was a, a set of optics that were uh, installed in the Hubble telescope that corrected this out of focus problem. And uh, now astronomers have uh, updated vision. So here are the astronauts servicing the Hubble telescope. They have to capture the telescope, uh, lock it down here, and then astronauts do spacewalks and uh, put in better optics, put in better detectors, instruments of one sort or another, replace batteries. Um, there were five servicing missions to the Hubble telescope, the last one being in 2009. And of course, technology for electronics, light detectors has improved since 1990. So this view on the right is what the Hubble telescope can do today. And the view on the left before the uh, most recent optics upgrade and uh, technology upgrade was installed. Um, there are telescopes on the Earth that can produce better uh, resolution images than the Hubble telescope over a very much smaller field of view, however. But this shows in the Keck telescope in Hawaii. On the left, just the ordinary view. On the right, using a system called adaptive optics, where there's a small mirror that uh, computer controlled is flexed to account for twinkling in the Earth's atmosphere and get rid of this uh, distortion caused by the Earth's atmosphere to get more detailed images. Of course, radio telescopes also are used by astronomers and X-ray telescopes. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about spherical aberration, but it is true for a sphere, all the light does not come to a common focus. So the fix for this is to use a parabolic mirror or use special grinding of the uh, lens surface. Or uh, if you have a spherical mirror and then some type of corrective lens on the end, uh, very common uh, for amateur astronomy telescopes to have this uh, arrangement of spherical mirror combined with a corrective lens uh, where the light comes in through the tube of the telescope to produce a sharp focus of all the energy. Important features for a telescope, uh, the diameter is prime. Um, we want to gather light and see dim objects, so the bigger the diameter, the more light is gathered. Um, resolution, that also goes uh, bigger diameter is better resolution, although uh, our Earth's atmosphere limits that effect, but out in space this is true. And we'll come up against this when we talk about wave optics. And then having a good sturdy mount uh, so the telescope doesn't wobble and is able to track the moon or the stars is uh, a very important feature. Magnification is actually not a good way to rate telescopes. It's very easy to have high magnification. Magnification is focal length of the objective divided by focal length of the eyepiece. Magnification is focal length of the objective divided by focal length of the eyepiece. So you can slap in a short focal length eyepiece and get high magnification, but it'll be worthless because the atmospheric effects will just give you a big blur. Uh, we do change the magnification by changing the eyepiece. That's the cheap part of the optic system. The objective is large, um, the expensive part of the system. So astronomers change magnification by putting in a different eyepiece. 
Here's a little view of the transparency of the Earth's atmosphere. Visible light comes through the Earth's atmosphere. There's light in the radio region. And then some portion of infrared light uh, can get into, uh, get below the Earth's atmosphere to where telescopes are on the ground. But the big advantage astronomers have now is telescopes that orbit the Earth in space. And they can make measurements in gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, still the visible, of course, infrared, and uh, uh, really produce uh, data on astronomical objects that is well informed because data is being collected over multiple wavelengths. Uh, here's a little bit of uh, some of the images, uh, X-ray images, Chandra. X-rays coming from regions around black holes or high energy, uh, high temperature uh, regions in space, visible light, and infrared, very good at locating where dust is located in our uh, uh, object of interest. So those are uh, some of the, uh, the highlights for, for telescopes. Um, we have uh, an advantage with the reflecting telescope of no chromatic aberration and be able to make larger mirrors for the uh, reflecting telescope. Um, the light gathering power is based on the area that's being collected. Pi r squared is the area of a circle. So we can compare light uh, collecting ability by squaring the diameters of the two telescopes and then dividing, or divide the diameters first and then square. We'll give the same result. So a, a nine inch telescope compared to a uh, four and a half inch telescope, those are diameters. The ratio is two. The nine inch telescope gathers four times as much light, two squared. A, um, a 20 inch telescope compared to a four inch telescope. Factor of five, square that. The 20-inch uh, telescope would gather 25 times more light. Um, so that's where we're going to end on this video. You should, of course, read the book. You should answer all the questions on the reading guide if you're in Professor Cunliffe's class, and then ask questions.